Tēnā koutou katoa, I'm Toby Manhoe, this is Gone By Lunchtime. Really excited the group of people we've got here today. Annabelle Lee Mather is here. Kia ora. Ben Thomas is here. Kia ora. And on keys, Te Aihe Butler. Tēnā koutou. Uh, lots to talk about today. Lots to talk about. First, I should say, terrible news. If you haven't already got a ticket to the Gone By Lunchtime session at the Auckland Writers Festival, it is sold out, it is full. So you'll need to go to the dark web or a sculpers den via gogo yeah to try and get hold of a ticket sorry I'm, about that i'm honestly appalled eh? like who pays to come and see us during a cost of living crisis well a, a bunch of, of champagne socialists I, am, too. I can tell you who will be there at the Auckland Writers Festival probably who has a ticket is Todd Stevenson the act art spokesperson i don't know if you saw this um uh, extraordinary compelling Roller coaster interview with Steve Braunius on <laughs> Newsroom, <laughs> in which he detailed his artistic um, portfolio, <laughs> his his love of arts and culture, his engagement with the arts, and eventually they resolved that he had <coughs> maybe read a book, maybe <laughs> read a music <laughs> book. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the difference, right? Between a lot of people think all the right wing is sort of the same, but this is sort of the demarcation between the the Tories, the Conservatives, who sort of think, you know, you've got to you've got to maintain these enduring institutions of culture, keep them going through the ages, you know, like pillars that hold us aloft as a society: the music, the symphony orchestra, the opera, theatre, hmm. classical music. Now, you know, Tamatatini has sort of fought its way, you know, through the institutions and has become one of those sort of, you know, without this, we're not a really, you know, what are we fighting for kind of things. And the neoliberals, you know, typified by by ACT in the 1980s, they're like, well, if people like it, they'll pay for it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and, the, and, and you can see where they kind of come to on this, right, because if you're an ACT party member, you know, you will spend a lot of time or – if you're a Nick Party grandee, you'll spend a lot of time rubbing shoulders with Ellen Gibbs and Jenny Gibbs and all these people who are patrons of the arts. Mm. And so act think, well, you know, if you're a struggling artist, you need some capital to back your creative endeavours. Just go and ask the Gibbses for money to help you subsist like we have for most of our 20-year life. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, it works fine. And and it's actually true, right? You know, Ellen Gibbs has, you know, obviously he's, he's best known for the Gibbs farm, the sculptures, mm. you know, the huge works. But he's, he's invested in writing and literature. He's paid for, you know, a great New Zealand book to be written. Mm. The Ellen Gibbs story by mm. Paul Goldsmith. Paul Goldsmith. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, the Fletcher Gross family, thing. one of New Zealand's sort of, you know, big families. Um, they're patrons of the arts. Uh, they had a book commissioned, History of the Fletcher Family by Paul Goldsmith. Mm. <laughs> Don Brash, former Reserve Bank governor, mm. one-time was, Act leader, one-time was, National Party leader. Was by... Patron of the arts, you know, commissioned the writing of a book about Don Brash's life by Paul mm. Goldsmith. Paul Goldsmith. You know, the, the the patronage system works. Yeah. This is how we know so much about rich and powerful people in ancient times. I was surprised they didn't even come up with I've Been Thinking as one of the great New Zealand books written by not Paul Goldsmith, surprisingly, but Richard Preble. Or Towards Prosperity. That's another good one. Mm. Um, unfinished Business. Unfinished Business is a classic. Uh, Out of the Red. That's another Richard Preble underappreciated book. He's a, actually quite a fun writer, Richard Preble. Um, if that's what you're into. But your thesis taken to its uh, logical end, Ben Thomas, is that the ACT Party is funded using the same mechanisms as most of the <laughs> art in New Zealand. Therefore, act the ACT Party is the great art, art installation in contemporary New Zealand. It's an avant-garde piece. Incredible. Right. It's the 2nd of May. I forgot to say that, so I'm saying it now. It's the 2nd of May in 2024. Lots to talk about. We'll talk about ministerial sackings. We'll talk about the poll that came out at the start of the week. We'll talk about the um, 7AA Waitangi Tribunal report, Ōrangi Tamariki, and um, we'll do some in-depth legal analysis, I imagine. That's the sort of thing we like to do. But first, let's have a word on Winston Peters, who has returned from his many travels abroad, uh, and gave a speech last night at Parliament in the Legislative Chamber um, in which he was going to clear the air about AUKUS. There was much 
we discussed this, I think, on the last pod, there was much confusion about where we were heading on AUKUS. It appeared that the government was getting warmer on the idea. idea. Meanwhile, the Labour opposition getting cooler on the idea. Winston Peters was going to settle it out and clarify it, and he didn't really do that at all in his speech. He just said, no, we're still deciding. We haven't been invited to the ball yet, so how can we possibly go to the ball? And the rest of the speech was just an extended subtweet of Helen Clark mm. and, uh, <laughs> and potentially Bob Carr, the former Australian foreign minister, who uh, returned this morning in questioning from Corin Dan on Morning Report, during which Winston Peters said that he was Bob Carr. Bob Carr, who had Bob Among Carr, other things. Bob that. Carr did say of Pillar 2, of Pillar 2 August, that it was a fragrant methane-wrapped piece of bullshit, which is, you know, in, in its own way, a colourful piece of language. Winston Peters was, uh, Carr immediately said, defamatory, and he's now threatening to sue him. So we'll see where that ends. But Annabelle, it's, you know, there's like the two Winstons. There's the the statesman Winston who travels the world and gives speeches at the UN and at Gallipoli and generally does a pretty good job. And then there's the absolute brawler Winston Peters at home. There's the street fighter, scrapper Winston. And this was a coming together. Those two dimensions should never touch each other, but they have touched each other in the last 24 hours. And that's really dangerous, isn't it? When those two Winstons start kind of inhabiting the same dimensional space. It's a little bit like, well, you know, when you're like back in the 80s, parents, they have the telephone voice. <laughs> when they they answer the phone when they're angry or and what, but they're very nice. And then the actual at home voice and then, Sometimes I get confused and they'd answer the phone angry or they'd accidentally get caught screaming at you on the phone. Very much that. And I think the the issue that Winston has is that um, Bob Carr, unlike um, Harry Tam, will not be a a peace-loving, reasonable kind of guy who will just (laughs) accept an apology from Winston over being defamed. Does it matter, Ben? I mean, it is... is you know, seriously, he's quite good at leaving that stuff in a domestic setting. And this, it's not great, is it? It's squirted out. I mean, really, look, my <clears throat> primary feelings about the matter are that I, I, don't, I don't support or agree with what Winston Peters said about Bob Carr or this podcast's decision to repeat it in a public forum. Nothing to do with me. Um, but... <laughs> wow. <well. laughs> We made it very clear. I mean, in fact, we talked about this with our legal department. David Parker did ask a question in the House under parliamentary privilege today. Yeah, parliamentary privilege is a different matter, though, under the Parliamentary Privileges Act. You, you say that, but... Um, I think what's interesting about it is the way that Luxon has responded to multiple questions in the media today. Mm. And usually you would think for such a serious misstep from a deputy prime minister and, and our, you know, our head diplomat, that you might get something at least as strong as, I am very disappointed to hear those comments. They certainly do not reflect mm. the view of the New Zealand government and I will be speaking to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade about them. They are very unfortunate. But instead, it was a rapturous praise of Winston, what a superb, excellent, brilliant, amazing, laser-focused job he's doing. Right, did he? And Mm. then many, many references to Bob Carr and the rough and tumble of, of politics. And I think it demonstrates that Luxon is really unable to um, sway or hold any hold hold his most senior members to to account it's i mean it's a, it, it's it, a perennial tricky one isn't it the other the other week christopher luxon mildly chided his two coalition leaders david seymour and winston peters for having a go at the waitangi tribunal over its attempt to summons summons karen shaw which we'll talk about later and then seymour hit back and said 
excuse me, <laughs> if you've got an issue, come, if I had an issue like that, it would come to me direct. How dare you go? And so, so it's a... And then yeah, this, the, this, this is the, the sort of matter that a leader of a political party should raise with another leader in person yeah. rather than through the media, as I intend to do. <laughs> and so right. it, was a, it was a real pushback. You right. know? And and again, look over, you know, uh, Luxon's comments about, you know, he's the prime minister, he decides who the ministers are and who has what portfolios. Um, you know, Seymour again said this week, well you wouldn't be able to sack an act minister without consulting me mm. as the leader. Uh, that would be a breach of the coalition agreement and its good faith provisions. So he he is, you know, ha- having having taken not a bloody nose, but, you know, probably having, having to step back a little bit over the last couple of weeks, he does, uh, yeah, maybe got a bit too gun shy in terms of addressing Peter's comments, which will go much wider than Wellington uh, on this. Um, but, he, you know, he really did fall back onto that. Well, it's not what I would have said. Did he yeah. say that's not the way I would have said that's, that's not, not the way I would have expressed it. Yeah, yeah that's the... That's the other the thing, stop. too, is post Simmons and, and Melissa Lee getting sacked, it looks a bit unfair. Like, a, yes, the disability stuff was absolutely terrible and she deserved a, a good telling off. Melissa Lee publicly dumped in a in a very mana disenhancing way um, for far, far lesser crimes, in my view. So it, it just seems to be, you know, an example of uh, unfairness in the approach of, of managing this cabinet. That was the, in much of the discussion around those demotions, which saw Penny Simmons lose the disability issues portfolio after that kind of catastrophic bungling of the issue around funding for people with disabilities and carers. Um, and Melissa Lee uh, lost the media portfolio, but was also, it was, was it was bigger because she lost her place in Cabinet, which mm. is which is a real, uh, which really mm. which really burns. There was some discussion about whether or not this is a sign of strength, sends a signal, you know, it's kind of that puts everyone on notice. Well, yes, it puts everyone on notice, except <laughs> those who happen <laughs> yeah. to be ministers from the other parties. Because they have immunity, it seems to be. Exactly. Because it really, it doesn't Casey look, Costello would be pretty high up the list, right? Like to look at other people who have been exactly. It kind of underlines that it wasn't a show of strength. Because if you're only showing strength when it comes to beating up the skinny kids, then mm. is that really a show mm. of strength? Mm. Yeah, that's right. It, it, it signals strength in the short term, but then you've you, then you, you've set a standard. If you set a standard for your ministers, you've set a standard for yourself for managing them. And look, in a coalition government, very vexed to do that uh, with ministers who aren't in your party. Also just problematic because, you know, Melissa Lee, she found herself on the, the, the tough end of a sort of media firestorm. Uh, that was the extent of her ills, really, was that she she couldn't respond in these interviews where she'd essentially been gagged in any case um, from talking about the process, from talking about what was happening. Uh, Luxon sort of said, and I presumably the ninth floor briefed to newsroom about how uh, Melissa Lee's, you know, her solutions had not mm. had not been adequate. You know, she hadn't performed well enough in coming up with uh, a response to mm. what was happening in the news and media and the broadcast industry. Generally, if you've come up with an ad- an, an, an inadequate policy response, if mm. if the prime minister or his team or the leadership know what they want done, mm. you just tell the minister to do it, and that doesn't seem to be the case here. I think it's that they don't they still don't have a solution. But, uh, we, you know, we're kind of, uh, you know, holding Melissa responsible for there not being an elegant solution to, you know, very, very long-standing and powerful trends in the media. Um, you know, I think if you talk about fairness, you know, I think that the, the Lee kind of sacking in particular is sort of gratuitousness of it, um, I think sort of stands out. Um mm. You know, Simmons, probably a good idea to relieve her of that portfolio. Mm. A couple of things had slipped under her notice, under her risk radar. Well, especially to... Very close. Yeah, especially close to, given to that she's dealing with tepukinga as well. Like, that's a whole other 
blazing inferno yeah. of a dumpster fire there. So, yeah, I agree. That and that's what she was brought in to do as mm. a specialist in tertiary education or vocational education. So, you know, that makes sense. You know, you didn't need to turn that into a big song and dance. And I think that his, Luxon's reasoning, which is this, he seems to very much see it as a, like as a, port, a financial portfolio <laughs> manager or something. He's about, you know, putting the, the different portfolios or the bundles of responsibility that cabinet ministers have, you know, allocating them most efficiently at a given time, kind of like taking a project off one team in your company and giving it to another team mm. because they've got more capacity or whatever. Now, that's a very different way of looking at these things. Um, you know, it might it might turn out to be really successful. It might not. We'll see whether he he does actually continue with this. As, well, he indicated that he would. He sort of yeah, yeah. Gave, gave the impression that there would be a sort of monthly review. I mean, didn't say that specifically, but that was the intimation. There'd be a monthly review, and that he would then move people around. It's the it's the specifically that moving out of cabinet thing, isn't it? Because it's, you get to turn up every Monday and sit around that table. You have the 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 you know a full seat at the in the cockpit of government, and mm. that and that was the one that made it seem. I think if he'd rem, you know taken that portfolio away, she's still got economic development, right, yeah. and um, and ethnic affairs, I think. So you know that's you can that's uh, but it meant that Simon Watts could come in for climate change. So climate change is in there. They're fine. That's I think that's hard to argue that that's not a good idea to have climate change at the table. But it did seem to me like, you know, there was that talk about the, I think it was the first action plan had 49 points on it, and maybe the one that they decided not to agree was number 50, which is sack some ministers to show, <laughs> you know, it seemed like part of it was like this is the message that, this is what it's really about, you know. Uh, yeah, I think so. And you, if you look at the polling as we are going to or are right now, whatever, um, that, I think we do now. that has been part of the continuing story is that apart from a bit of a blip in, uh, I think, January, February, where Luxon's numbers went up and approval of the government went up and right track, wrong track improved, apart from that, it's been a, it's been a pretty depressing picture for the government. They, they haven't had this sort of protracted honeymoon. They didn't really get much of a bump from the election at all. Yeah. Uh, and whatever bump they did get is now well and truly sort of uh, dissipated. They're, they're now in the sort of pre-budget announcement zone and, you know, we'll be hoping to get some, you know, that that bears some fruit. But that poll, which in case you missed it, was One News on on a day earlier this week and uh, National dropped by two points to 36. New Zealand First fell just underneath the 5% threshold, meaning that if you totted up the numbers, assumed Te Pāti Māori get at least one seat, that you would ha the opposition parties could form a government. Um, uh, I haven't crunched the numbers on if, if New Zealand first got an extra, you know, mm. percentage point, whether it m might not be the case. So it's still, it's not, it's not, it's not kind of overwhelming, but it's pretty unusual, as has been remarked, for a, for a first-term government at this point in the cycle to see themselves coming second. But also, and you make this point, Ben, you know what you think, Annabelle, the, had it not been for that being the big headline, there would probably be more focus on the fact that Christopher Luxon lost two points and preferred Prime Minister and sits at 23%. I mean, the general message from the New Zealand public says, I don't really like any of these people because Chris Hipkins is on 16 and they're, you know. But isn't it at this point when with previous Prime Ministers, you sort of get used to them. They get their feet under the table. They take on that air of gravitas that just comes with the office. And, you know, it's like we're getting a wearing a new pair of boots. You just get used to the feel of the boots and they seem like the right person for the job. And so it's kind of, yep, I'd pro that's the way. Is it personal? Is it just the general malaise that is in a cost of living uh, world? What is it? I think, I think there's a couple of things. Firstly, I think that Luxon isn't able to make some tough calls and do some some leadership looking kind of moves because every time he tries to he gets cut down by Winston right. and and David. So I think that's a that that's and, an and, issue and that, that he has. And that gives the impression of tail gives, wagging the dog. Exactly. I think the other thing is I listened to an interview with Ben and Simon Wilson earlier this week and I ben thought Ben Thomas. Ben Thomas. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you know him? Oh very good. Very He's good. Very good. Yeah. Um, I was listening to an interview earlier this week with um, Ben Thomas and Simon Wilson on RNZ, and Simon mm -hmm. made the point that 
um, this government appears to be continuously punching down in a way that the ele- that voters didn't necessarily sign up for, such as you know school lunches, um, that kind of thing, and that doesn't get the endorphins going. People don't feel good when you're reading every day about unemployment rising, um, all these different sort of issues that weren't really a part of the narrative during the election. And I think, yeah, it, it's there, it, there hasn't been enough good vibes uh, in, ter- in terms of in, in terms of policies, mm. we've seen a lot of slashing and mm. cutting and getting rid of. And then the policies that have been passed, like um, the um, interest for landlords, like the, it's a very small pool of New Zealanders who benefit from it. So for the vast majority, you come away not feeling great about what's happening in the country. The other thing that really surprised me about the poll is how well the Greens vote is standing up and, it, and in fact gone up despite them having an absolute horror, horror. of That's a year. Right. Like Ju- Julia em- and Genta charging across the Houses of Parliament <laughs> is going to see them soar higher. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, you know, MP after MP down and, yeah. and yet yeah. their vote has held up and I... Yeah, I mean, why is that? Is it because Labor is seen to be underperforming? Is it because even though they've had these difficulties, they've communicated their way through them very well? I'm not sure, but I thought that was quite remarkable. Yeah. Ben, I don't want to um, make you repeat whatever it was you said on RNZ, whatever that is, but <laughs> how, how, how? I mean, the, the, the mojo machine <laughs> the vibes. Isn't, isn't firing, Annabelle's right. You know, it doesn't. That's a hard ask, though, at the same time to get the mojo flowing through the streets of the country when the mood is still bleak and you need to reflect that. I mean, here, look, for example, the we recently had the cost of living numbers come out from Stats NZ and, and the increase has fallen. <laughs> <laughs> it's, dropped, it's gone down to 6.2% yeah. increase in the last 12 months. So, I mean, is that a good news story? Not really. It's really, it's, I mean, you can't kind of walk into a supermarket without finding that it costs you $100, you know? Oh, yeah, like, like leaving the house costs 100 bucks these days. You know, it's, it's just gone as soon mm. as you leave your house. Like, um, yeah, and, and I think this is the issue, right? A lot of people now say, you know, oh, the vibes are bad, the vibes are no good. The vibes are no good. And, and, and what they mean <laughs> is the economy's bad. <laughs> the, the economy's bad, you know, like... And and that has much more of an impact on people's lives. And and you know during the GFC, I think this was a comparison Mikey Sherman made that during the GFC, when John Key had been in power for around this time, soaring in the polls, doing great, everyone loved everyone loved the new national government. That's true, but with the GFC, inflation was still under control. In in an attempt to get the economy sort of kickstarted again, interest rates were actually falling. Mm. People were finding their mortgages. We're costing mm. less to refix. Mm. If you kept your job, and that that's not no not a certain thing because unemployment did spike during the GFC, you know, went up by a couple of percentage points. It was a bad scene. But if you kept your job, your standard of living was about the same, and it might even be a little bit better because of falling interest rates. Mm. Right now, with the, the thing with inflation, we haven't had an inflation problem since the 90s. So a lot of people forgot about this. You know, inflation makes everyone feel worse off yes. month after month after month. And you can't stimulate your way out of it. Yeah. And Keynes is not available. You don't you don't feel you don't feel like you're standing still, which I think is the sort of malaise vibes are off kind of thing that maybe happened in 2017, I think when GDP was flat. The uh, per capita GDP was flat. And right now it's negative. Uh, you know, people didn't feel like they were getting ahead. They felt things were getting more crowded. Right now, people are finding that they just have less money every day, that every week they go to work and come back, and 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 that just has such an impact on 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 the, on the country. And you know, and you're right. The the general the buzz of the news in general is. Job cuts. Uh, I saw today, you know, New Zealand Fashion Week's been cancelled this year. You know, the kinds of things that sort of 
add color and flavor and interest to life mm. are kind of being sort of whittled down because it, things are hard out there. People don't have a lot of disposable cash. Uh, and at the same time, you know, even getting up, going to work is a grind for people. Paying for pay, rents are up 8.0% according to Trade Me, which is not the most reliable figures, but it's still an indication of the, the mood. But it also doesn't help when you've got Luxon saying, like reacting to the polls by saying stuff like, look, we people are feeling it, you know, they're doing it tough, but we're the t- government that will make the tough dis- decisions like, you know, punishing people for being on the benefit <laughs> and stuff. I'm like, also, <laughs> this, this is hard for us too. Yeah. It's really hard. How do you man? think I felt? I, I was the person who had to kick them out of the house. <laughs> exactly. like, you know. Hey, but uh, listen, me and T.I. here, we've been thinking a lot about the vibes. Oh. And we had a discussion earlier about how we could perhaps fix the vibe situation. And what we think... For the podcast or the country? No, for the country. Okay. This is some free advice for, for the marketing department mm. and, and Christopher Luxon's government, who have been absorbed, I think, by the broadcasting department. I'm not sure. Anyway, <laughs> right. what we think he should do, he just needs a little bit of this every time he says something like, we're not afraid to punish the people on the benefit. Like, it just changes the whole mood of it. Yes. He just needs a bit of someone to stand next to him and just do that at the press, a, at the press like conferences and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Did you see the photo of him with uh, John Key and he and their... Um, yeah, their their t shirts with you know the kind of basketball. Yes, what numbers. was that? What what were those numbers? Like, uh, that was the which prime minister they were. Key's the thirty eighth. Ah. He's the forty second. And. I really like that Luxon is a merch guy. I like that, you know, he, he, you feel like, you know, he was the sort of guy who, like, wore his Leavers jersey for three years through university, and then he went overseas to work for Unilever and saw, you know, sports teams and NBA stores and stuff, and was like, I'm home, you know? That every year he does that um, Christmas tradition with his family where they take a photo and they're all wearing matching pyjamas. Oh, God. And... Yeah, like I, I re- I actually really like. I totally unironically really like it, and I well, think you that- would love the Kardashians because they're big on merch, <laughs> and they also wear matching Christmas pajamas. I, I think he just needs to get every New Zealander a baseball shirt mm. with their name on it and like Team mm. Kiwi on the Team back. of Five Million. Team of Five Million. Copyright it. Yeah. Make sure <laughs> our dude gets no credit for it. And then, and then, like, and then we face, we all face it together, you know. I love it. I uh, saw Chris Bishop at a. Th- that could be what he spent his fifty grand pay rise on. I saw Chris Bishop at a thing in Wellington yesterday and suggested to him that he should go into the next cabinet meeting wearing forty three t shirt with forty three. Said <laughs> <laughs> so he's up to that challenge or not. I love it. Now, uh, the Waitangi Tribunal, was it an urgent report that emerged in recent days? An inter- intermediary inter- inter- report? Inter- intermediate report? A report. It was an urgent hearing and they did an interim report. Interim report. Okay. After I knew the, it was a word that started with an I, but it this After the one. urgent ju- judicial review application to the High Court from the Minister. So there's two sort of connected but separate pieces to this story, really, which we should probably deal with one by one. The first is the uh, complaint that's been taken via the Waitangi Tribunal, which relates to the removal of Section 7AA in the Oranga Tamariki Act. Yes. That's what it's called. Mm-hmm. And what, which is part of the Act Party policy, and that is being overseen by Minister for Children, Karen Shaw. The Waitangi Tribunal attempted to summons Karen Shaw. Said, actually, the, the, she, she, the minister said, no, thank you very much. And then that ended up being a uh, playing out in the High Court. But what, was sticking there a, with the... Was hmm. there a step prior to that where they Probably. requested information from Karen Shaw's office, which she didn't provide to yeah, them, right. and yeah. then they summonsed yeah. her? Yes. Yeah. And then she also declined the summons as well. So let's leave that for a second. Mm-hmm. What, 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 what did the Waitangi Tribunal... Say the interim, inter, 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 interim, inter, interim report. Interlocutory yeah. report. Um, basically, it has three main areas of concern. It doesn't make any recommendations. It just wants to raise three issues um, to the the uh, stakeholder ministers. 
One is their concern that legislation um, that's about upholding treaty principles would be overturned to honour a... Coalition agreement? A coalition agreement. The second is the actual harm that could be done by removing the Act. And the third is the impact that it will have on the strategic partners and relationships that have been developed um, through through that Act with those people because there has been no consultation with those interested parties or stakeholders about the repeal of the legislation. So 7AA specifically requires that... The, it gives um, special requirements on the, the CE of Oranga Tamariki mm. to meet measurable um, outcomes, practical um, outcomes that uh, honour the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi, um, enhance the well-being of Tamariki Māori, help them stay connected to their identity and their iwi, um, and ultimately address the massive inequity within Oranga Tamariki because six out of ten children in Oranga Tamariki Kia are Tamariki Māori. And the tribunal found that there's the 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 question of whether or not it's consistent with the requirements of the Treaty of Waitangi, but also the irrespective of that, by whether by removing it it would uh, remove a requirement that is to the benefit in its view of the children. Of the Tamariki that are in the care of Oranga Tamariki, yeah. And and ultimately this is this all comes from a pretty blunt instrument, which is that 7AA is the section that ACT and I think New Zealand First uh, think is responsible for, you know, these sort of uh, highly publicised cases of uh, Māori children who are with Pākehā families and then they get sort of reverse uplifted away from the foster parents um, and then, you know, placed, you know, back, you know, with just some more culturally appropriate sort of backgrounds or whatever. Um, with, their, they, with their family. Well, yeah. I, ideally well, I, with, I, ideally, ideally yeah. with their family I, or their kin's yeah. people, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Which, you know, and and there are partnerships, you know, where mm. that's done really well, you know, in terms of reconnecting people with their, uh, reconnecting children, you know, with their, you know, the wider hapu, um, if the family is sort of, you know, not necessarily mm. in a, a sort of fit position, um, there's a number of partnerships too. Where we've got a really good one with their local office uh, for Oranga Tamariki along those lines. Um, and then there are some, you know, cases which you read about in the news where, you know, it turns out the wider family are not in a particularly great mm. state to receive the kids either. And 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 so, you know, this is, it is a, it's a you know, it's a, one thing that's been noted in a lot of the decisions is and the res, uh, regulatory impact statement is there's not necessarily a clear connection between 7AA and these particular decisions. Right. Uh, it's, it, it, you know, and, and 7AA doesn't actually dictate how you do, mm. you know, how you actually implement, you know, the partnerships. It doesn't, and, you know, I think Karen Chow herself has said, you know, the, the, the partnerships uh, with iwi groups will continue, you know, she wants them to continue. So, you know, it, all of this seems to be it's sort of, I think it's a bit of a faint, you know, a, a political sort of um, convenience to get rid of 7AA, um, you know, to sort of show that you're doing something, mm. which is a bit, mm. it's easier to do that than do the, you know, try and reform the culture from the inside. You know, that yeah. Kind of thing. Um, so uh, one of the pointers made in the um in the report that, you know, some of those alarming uplifts or some of the alarming behaviour that you might see from Oranga Tamariki is actually about social welfare practice and individual individual practitioners mm, rather than yeah. the 7AA policy itself. And the other thing it talks about is that it's happened in such a quick, it's such a short time, mm. the repeal, that there hasn't actually been adequate time to investigate what, what the unintended consequences might be, um, to look at the evidence and the data and what it tells us and to look at, you know, what the best thing is to replace it with. It, you know, obviously 7AA is not perfect. Oranga Tamariki isn't perfect, but you don't just chuck the baby out the bat with the bathwater, if you'll excuse the pun. The other thing that I find interesting about it is, you know, 7AA is 
a lot to do with keeping tamariki connected to their their identity, their culture, their whānau, all of those things. And when I've read interviews with Karen Shaw and watched them, one of the things that she talks about quite often is that as a child when her mother could no longer care for her or when the relationship between her and her mother broke down, she wanted to return to her grandmother in Northland who had raised her and was told by SIFS or whatever it was called at the time that her grandmother didn't want her. And that was a mummy that she carried for a long time because she wanted to be with her nanny who had raised her. And then as an adult, she just her grandmother told her that actually she very much wanted her back. She had asked for her back and SIFS had told her that she was too old. So, you know, 7AA mm. is designed to prevent those sorts of situations from happening, that when there is, an, there is a whānau who are resourced and capable and mm. loving and wanting of a tamaiti, that they get the first opportunity to care for those tamariki. So it's a strange, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a strange response. The Waitangi Tribunal is, of course, not much loved by either of ACT or New Zealand First. So... When that process began, they both of those parties saw an opportunity to uh, <clears throat> to articulate their concerns <laughs> with the Waitangi Tribunal, uh, which is of course not a court of law. It's I think the way it's usually described is as closest to being like a permanent commission of inquiry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, as we know, it was created in 70, 1975 and then in. 1985, its uh, remit was expanded to go back to 1840, so it's often thought of as something that is about treaty settlements, but that, in fact, wasn't its prime, prime, its first its first mm. role. Mm. Uh, ben, you're, the, um, you're very much the Jeffrey Palmer of Gone by Lunchtime, so tell us what played out in terms of the tribunal's attempt to summons the Minister for Children, Karen Chow. Well, the, f- the first thing that happened was uh, the Crown invoked the principle of comity, which is oh, I love a bit which of comity, is, which is about the separation of powers. It basically says that uh, the courts shouldn't be poking their nose into what Parliament is doing when it's running its own business, and that um, Parliament should not poke its nose into what the courts are doing. So that's why we we see that, you know, ministers like Stuart Nash can get into real trouble when they talk about, um, you know, decisions by judges because you're not meant to do that as a minister. You're meant to leave the judges to it. They interpret the law. Um, <clears throat> and the fond wish of our parliamentarians over the last probably 15 years or so has been that the courts would... <laughs> would kind of reciprocate that uh, and not try and interrogate sort of political proceedings Mm. um, that, you know, information had been... So the Waitangi Tribunal was, you know, it has a very, very wide ambit in terms of the things that it can look for in terms of something that is either going to harm Māori or is a breach of the principles of the treaty. And it seemed to be getting a reasonable way into kind of basically just wanting to sort of put the minister up and kind of scold her and and sort of, inter- you know, try and figure hey, out sure. what was in her mind, yeah. But and, that's because she didn't provide the information that she asked for. But but also, like, what would be wrong with wanting to understand the motivation for yeah, getting, you know... Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think it was getting off base when they were... You know, the, the original questions that were provided were, you know, what consultation's been done? You know, do, do you have any advice on the effects, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you kind of, you know, once they've said, look, this was put in because it was in it, you know, this was signed off by Cabinet because it was in the coalition agreement, and that's about it. Um, you, you sort of, you kind of know what's happening there. Um, I, I don't think you gain anything more by sort of trying to probe Karen Chow's subjective experience of this. You know, you know that consultation hasn't really been done, that it was just a promise. Um, so, look, I, I think the tribunal was sort of overstepping the mark a bit, but, and, and the court in the end found that, the High Court found that 
there was nothing that the minister would be able to produce under questioning that was necessary, you know, for the tribunal's decision making about whether whether there was a breach here. And in terms of, <clears throat> you know, because what we're talking about is a prospective law change, so uh, you really you're talking about in t you know intentions and subjective thoughts, and and you know that's not really there. You you'll the that, that's not what the tribunal is meant to be interrogating they're not trying to interrogate are you a good person they're trying to interrogate they're trying to look at you know what will the effects of this be um can i say <coughs> that what i find hilarious is literally like you know all this cordial about democracy and separation of powers and media independence and all of the politicians like kick the shit out of the media all the time and we've seen like a, a a, a rise in, a, in politicians who are kicking the shit out of like the Waitangi Tribunal and just the courts in general and, you know, Labour and others, you know, both. But the one tapu, tapu agency, organisation, body, body in New Zealand that no one will ever talk shit about is the remuneration commission. <laughs> like, everyone's like, I cannot possibly say because they are tapu and independent and I shall not venture an opinion. It's just like three dudes, eh, who work part-time who are like, yeah, fuck, pay them this much. If it was chicks, if there was women on that commission, no one would be getting a pay rise. Oh, wow, what a take. In my view. What a take, amazing. Um, good. Well, I think we've I think we've we've solved all of that. Good to have had some thorough legal, political, moral analysis of the week, and also to bring back to the nation some good vibes. Mm -hmm.